Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Mahjabeen Islam. And I am Dr. Ketley Daniels. And we are entirely delighted to begin this podcast series to talk about addiction and its treatment. The information in this podcast cannot replace your seeking a treatment provider, which you can easily do at SAMHSA's National Helpline at findtreatment.gov or 1-800-622-4357. We have a wonderful series of topics lined up for you, and our main idea is to provide useful information to our audience about addiction and have people understand that addiction is a chronic disease, much like diabetes and high blood pressure, and if it is treated properly, we can transform lives. We will also look at some other addictions, such as internet addiction, gaming addiction, gambling, and pornography addiction. So, before we get into each individual substance, why don't we let people know a little bit more about us? How did you end up into medicine? It's kind of a funny story. In Pakistan, where I was born and spent about 15 years of my life, women were supposed to be either doctors or teachers, and I was kind of nerdy. And though I enjoyed teaching, I didn't want to do it full time. Actually, deep inside, I wanted to be a flight attendant as a Pakistan International Airlines flight attendant in those days was really very glamorous. They called them air hostesses then, and actually they still do. And Pakistan International in those days chose air hostesses on the basis of height, weight, and good looks. They looked so gorgeous in their uniforms. Quite the ideal for a seven-year-old girl. I found out, though, kind of coincidentally, that my family did not look too approvingly at air hostesses, and so I decided to not ruffle feathers. I was a bit of a conformist, and I got into medical school. Tell me, uh, why did you choose medicine? Well, I recall even to this day a discussion my uncle had with us as children. My cousins and myself and my siblings, we were all asked what we wanted to be when we grew up. And when it was my turn, I said... I wanted to be a mom. The other children thought it was funny, so I reconsidered it. I considered what else I would want to be and thought, well, I have always wanted to help people, so I decided I was going to be a physician. And that was, a, that was the sector of the others. And then I remembered, as you asked me this question, I remembered a movie that was on television, and the medical doctor was interviewing students, and they were being asked why they wanted to be physicians. And the camera panned all the faces, and all of them answered the same thing, the same way, because I want to help people. And it occurred to me as I was watching it that if I was asked why I wanted to be a physician, I would have given the same answer, to help people. So that's why I chose medicine. I have enjoyed being both a mom and a physician. Which medical school did you attend? So my father was a diplomat, and I went to high school in Turkey and Singapore, which was like an amazing experience. But at the time of starting medical school, my father was transferred back to Pakistan. So I went to one of the oldest medical schools in Pakistan called Dow Medical College. It was based on the British system, so it was a five-year program. And I really look at that time really fondly, and it really was, like the song says, the best years of my life. From what I remember, you went to uh, medical school right here in Toledo, right? I did. I attended the Medical College of Ohio. And for those of you who've been around, you know that name because now it's known as the University of Toledo Medical Center. I remember I enjoyed my experiences significantly. And one of the reasons I was supposed to be a surgeon, by the way, but I chose psychiatry because many of the patients I worked with as a student I remember they really wanted to be heard. They were in pain, and they wanted someone to understand that they were hurting and they were scared. One example that came into my mind very vividly is a young woman that was um, having an asthma attack when she came into the emergency room. And you can see the fear in her face. And I remember as a student, we had to find our space in all the, you know, commotions in the ER. And I'm under there trying to get to her eyes and trying to reassure her that she was going to be fine. And I said to the attending, can we just tell her what we're doing so that she's not as scared? And the attending looked at me. (laughs) We're not here to make them comfortable. We're trying to save lives. And I said, oh. So I went back to my space and I was holding her hand trying to walk her through it. But psychiatry has been a good 
fit for me, and I stayed at the medical school because the training was awesome. I met some great people, had some good mentors, and I'm right where I want to be. Where did you complete your training? So another funny story. I was matched into Mercy Family Practice here in Toledo, and uh, in those days, I still remember my name actually can be pronounced Mahjabeen or Mehjabeen. And someone introduced me as Mehjabeen, and a salesperson heard magic beans. So for all my residency colleagues, then I was magic beans and still am. How funny that I too wanted to do surgery. I really did. But then I noticed that Dr. Gandhi would have rounds at four o'clock in the morning. And I really am not a morning person. I've tried to change that, but it hasn't really worked. Uh, also, it was very much a man's world. And surgery was cutthroat competition, and it uh, did not jive with my personality as much as I really wanted to do it. There are a lot more uh, women in medicine in the U.S. now, but in the 1980s, there were a lot more women in medicine in Pakistan than there were here. And many a time, and this really kind of would unnerve me a bit, patients here would think I was a nurse. In fact, I remember a patient asking me after I had introduced myself as Dr. Islam that are you sure you're not a nurse? And that's kind of like just stayed with me. And I was disappointed actually initially with being in family medicine for family docs in Pakistan were referred to as GPs with that little, you know, element of bias. But as time has gone on, I began to like family medicine more and more because in family medicine, we treat the entire patient and we are the greatest advocates for the patient. It's been a great plus also on a flight when they announce if there's a doctor on board for I can truly attend a sick traveler. And it kind of adds up to the joy of being a family physician. I have to tell you a funny story. I was flying back just recently from um, wherever I was, and the airplane was going through so much turbulence that people were freaking out. And right behind me was someone having an issue. I'm not sure what it was, but as I listened, I thought, I bet she's having a panic attack. And she was asking the attendant for this, asking for that, and the attendant was getting quite disturbed. And then I said, oh, my gosh, I should help because I'm pretty sure it's not cardiac. And I think we could help. So I said, okay, I'm going to just make a motion and ask her. And so the attendant came over to me, and I said, you know, I'm a doctor. I think I can help. She says, well, we already EMS is coming, and we'll be fine, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay. So I left it alone. And the whole commotion, and I know she was having paresthesias, little numbers and tingling, right, right. And all typical, the symptoms. Typical stuff. But I thought it was funny that, you know, often I try not to get into the mix because people will not really listen when you try to give them feedback. They already have their preconceived ideas. Ideas, yeah. But I thought about that when you were saying what you were saying. Yeah, yeah they, uh, there have been many episodes in which I've had uh, to help yeah. uh, in flights, and uh, it's been... That part has been reassuring because we treat the entire yeah. patient. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. So how did you get into addiction medicine, though? Yeah, I was just actually passing the street where I was, my office was at the time. I'd started private practice on South Burn Road, and I needed coverage for my practice. And Dr. Travis, who was medical director at the time of the Tennyson Center, uh, St. Vincent's Drug Rehab Unit, said he would cover my family practice if I would cover the detox unit. And I was like... I, I don't know anything about addiction. And he said, oh, very, very, very confidently kind of like shrugged and said, you learn. And I did. I loved every minute of it and took the American Board of Addiction Medicine certification exam and much to my surprise became board certified. So uh, tell me about your interest in addiction, uh, Medicine Ketley. I think over the years, I've treated many other addictions, but not narcotics addiction necessarily. But I remember a discussion you and I had, and you recommended that I join the ranks of providers. And I was glad that I, I decided to, to join the, the ranks. And in my ongoing treatment of people with various issues, we find that treating addictions just added to what I could offer, not only opioids, but also alcohols, alcoholics, and other addictions, such as I, I mentioned earlier, gaming and pornography. And, and it's been a ride, for sure. It's a, it's a very different population treating opioid addiction. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, you have always been involved in the treatment of addictions, however, even before the epidemic, right? 
Oh, yes, yes. It was soon after I set up private practice that I started uh, practicing addiction medicine and that uh, interaction with Dr. Travis. And I've actually been fortunate that I've been involved with all uh, phases of addiction medicine treatment, whether it's methadone maintenance or uh, inpatient or outpatient treatment. And I've written the detox protocols of a lot of addiction centers in Toledo, have been medical director of many of the facilities here. And the interesting part is that I practice both family and addiction medicine in my practice. And what we are trying to do, particularly from a push with the American Society of Addiction Medicine, is we realize that unless primary care practices start to practice addiction medicine, we're not going to be able to get our arms around the opioid epidemic. So I really do enjoy family medicine, like I mentioned before. But in family medicine, you can change a person's, a patient's course in a matter of decades by reducing their risk factors. But in addiction medicine, we turn lives around within three months. And that turnaround, I, when I do my PowerPoints, I talk about turnarounds, and that's how I present it. And people who, uh, it's like a, uh, an amazing 180 degree transformation. So I really, really enjoy the practicing addiction medicine. One of the reasons I, I've been very into it is to have people recognize that it's a chronic disease, much like diabetes and hypertension and other chronic diseases. But, you know, I was thinking, even even though it's not always known, but in psychiatry, it's such an important area for us to delve into as well when patients come to see us, because so often it's a secret that they keep to themselves the substances Correct. that they're using or abusing or dependent on. I've seen people for many years or many months that I'm thinking everything is good, they're stable on their meds, and then they'll share how much they've been drinking or they'll share how much pot they've consumed or they'll share what else is going on. So as physicians, we do have to take a moment and try to dig deeper because we can help change lives if we address the whole picture. Indeed. And, you know, society has really stigmatized uh, addiction. When, and now we're trying to make people understand that it's a chronic disease, much like diabetes and hypertension. But because of the stigma, there's a great deal of shame. And so the patient is not going to write in their history uh, about their uh, drug or alcohol use. It is really incumbent on us as physicians to, to pull that history out in a very, in a safe environment. I'm remembering a gentleman that I saw years ago. He was an alcoholic, and he got sober, but he kept smoking. And as we went on through several years of treatment, he was told that he had to stop smoking because of vascular disease. And he admitted that he didn't really want to stop. That's why he didn't want to you know, address the smoking. And I think for a lot of people we see in our practice, they don't want to stop that behavior. And until they want to stop, we can't help them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I tell people that I have everything. We have the treatment uh, if they have the motivation. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that if I had the motivation pill, my face would be on the cover of Time magazine. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. It, it really would, would have been. So what do you hope? What do you hope that we can achieve in our Treat Addiction podcast series? I think both of us, because of our practices, have experienced the success and wonderful outcomes of treating patients with addictions, like I just mentioned, the turnaround. So our podcast is going to try to explain that addiction is a chronic disease like diabetes and hypertension. This is a very vital piece for people to understand, for family members and the larger population, for politicians, legislators, to understand that it is a chronic disease. And also that it's very treatable, and if the appropriate medication is obtained and the necessary behavioral treatment is done, sobriety is not just possible, but durable. Yeah, I agree. But as I alluded to earlier, you've heard the joke, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, the answer is one, <laughs> but the light bulb has to want to change. Exactly. And I think if people come to us with a desire to make changes, we are definitely able to provide treatment and support. And one of my favorite sayings is that I can't make the change happen for you, but I can walk with you on this journey. Oh, that's and awesome. And we have that to offer many people. Al along with medications and behavioral counseling and, and therapy, we can do that. So is there a typical profile of a person 
that you think of when you think of drug addiction? I'm really glad that you bring that up because society, like we mentioned, has marginalized people with addiction. And back in the day, when cocaine and alcohol were the main issues, we got used to the concept of the bum under the bridge. And that really was when my addiction career began. That's what we were treating. We were treating alcohol and cocaine. But since the opioid epidemic, it is so important to realize that the disease of addiction crosses all boundaries of race, religion, wealth, and profession. And there's a statistic that says that now every fourth person in the United States knows someone who has the disease of addiction. And patients can be across the spectrum. I'm really fortunate that I I practice addiction in my private practice because it lends a level of normality on the one hand and anonymity on the other because the patient is coming into a regular office as opposed to a a treatment center. And we see that uh, patients can be professionals, students, homemakers, and a variety of, I mean, just across the board uh, occupations. So that was all about us and what we are going to try and achieve. In our next episode, we will explore the why me syndrome because that is such a such a preeminent kind of feeling. It's a pervasive feeling among patients in general and I think addiction patients in particular, as well as the impact of addiction, explaining how some people become addicted to some substances while others do not, as well as the actual toll that addiction has taken in our country. I want to thank my co-host, Dr. Ketley Daniels, for a wonderful conversation today. I'm your host and producer, Dr. Mahjabeen Islam. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Ketley Daniels. And our executive producer is Chris Pfeiffer. If you have any questions, comments, or you just want to listen again, go to wgte.org slash treat addiction or wherever you stream your podcasts. And until the next episode, do remember patience in difficult times and gratitude always. See you soon. WGTE. Voices around us. WGTE is supported in part by the American Rescue Plan Act funds allocated by the City of Toledo and the Lucas County Commissioners and administered by the Arts Commission.